there is a whole science of consecration. It's a very powerful science. You must come and experience, there is one here at the Tennessee Center. If you come to India, it will just blast you in the face, you don't have to believe anything. As a Pakistani who's studying uh, with Indians here and, you know, we live uh, in harmony. Yeah, outside that region, they do wonderfully well today. Of course. <laughs> this is what my question is that uh, we are divided by border, but we share a lot of things. How can you think that we can come together and really alleviate the miseries and work together for a better future? So, what is a nation today in the world is, still we've not come to that place where we can all embrace each other and live as one nation, the entire planet. I wish someday we will get there, but you see you're already Brexiting. <laughs> see, what… what Europe has done in the last uh, fifteen, twenty years is a truly phenomenal, fantastic achievement. After World War I, World War II, nobody ever thought the Germans and the French and the Italians and the English could come together. Nobody imagined. Could you have imagined this in 1945? I'm asking you. No. no. But you achieved this European Union. It's not a small thing. Don't think it's just an economic arrangement. It's a huge evolution in human consciousness. But I'm saying, similarly, this India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, this whole region, including Sri Lanka, Nepal, everything was like one nation. Though politically we were a bit different nations, there were times when we were over two hundred different political entities, but still we were one nation in culture, in… in many different ways, in our transactions together. We are all pushing for this, that South Asia region, we are looking at something like EU. Politically you can still be different, you can do whatever damn religion you want, but economically, if we come together, we were the most prosperous part of the world at one time. That is because we operated as one at that time in many different ways. But today, there is no way, everybody is trapped in their own little boundaries. If young people, all of you and all of you, if you are interested in the future of this world, we've still not come to that place where People can just live out of their consciousness, leaving their religion, their heaven and stuff and all that. But we must do this much in your generation. The coming generation must do this much. Religion should be a personal pursuit for people. Those who wish to, they pursue personally their own stuff. But this ambitious way of approaching that, my religion should conquer the world, must go. This is one achievement you must do in the next twenty-five years, otherwise with the kind of technological advancements we have, we will have a massive disaster on this planet, isn't it? The days of the sword are over. The days of the sword are over. Now if we continue with the same attitude, we will have a super massive disaster which will not be benefit anybody for that matter, okay? So this is one thing we should push for. If you want to push for this, the most important thing is religion becomes just purely a personal pursuit, never a national goal or a, a global goal. It is actually a global goal right now. It should just be personal pursuit, never a global goal. If you do this one thing, India, Pakistan, all these nations and many other nations coming together will become a reality. The significance that you achieve by acquiring money, wealth, education, this or that, is only socially relevant. If nobody is around you, it means nothing. Becoming life significant means you captured a certain volume of life that just sitting here, this feels absolutely significant. So why this Shambhavi? What we are trying to do with this is to capture more life than we have right now that if we sit here, just being alive is more than enough. 
because this is the most significant aspect of your life is that you're alive right now, isn't it? Everything else is secondary. Everything else are arrangements which we made so that in some way it will facilitate enhancement of life. Either knowingly or consciously or unconsciously or in their own different ways, different human beings have captured different levels of life. The entire process, what we call a spiritual process, is essentially about becoming a more significant life, not in relation to somebody else, not being better than somebody. Just if I sit here, this is a fantastic life because it's significant by its own presence. Only if it's like this, then you will do life in a conscious manner. You will not be compelled to do anything. You will do things that really matter. You will not be compulsive about anything because just sitting here is very significant for you. Because life has become significant. Not thought, not emotion, not body, not things that we have gathered, but just the life process has become very significant. So significant that body, mind, wealth, society, everything becomes secondary in our experience. So yoga means we obliterate the boundaries of our individuality, the boundaries that we have established so that this life becomes so significant that your being becomes stronger than your thought, stronger than your emotion, stronger than all the things that people are saying about you, good or bad things. Every other thing that society confers upon you, you as a life is much more significant than all those things. How you understand God, gods, the divine, do you have a conception of that? And if so, what is it? So when we say conception, we are referring to concepts. When we say concepts, obviously they're constructed in our minds, whatever our concepts are. Probably you're referring to the thirty-three million gods and goddesses of India. I was thinking about them, yeah. <laughs> These thirty-three million happened when our population was thirty-three million. <laughs> Since then, because of Western influence and Western education, we've become little shy of creating gods. We must understand this, in, in, in India, in the northern part of India, these terminologies have been lost because of invasions and the kind of beating that northern India has taken over a period of time. But in southern India, still a deity or a what you… See, the word God doesn't belong to India. We don't have such a word actually. There's no the God word anywhere. We call them Bhagwan. Bhagwan means a blessed being. That's the highest word we kind of have. There is no the God word anywhere. So uh, these deities are referred to as yantras. The word yantra literally translates into a machine or an instrument. So these are instruments to access different dimensions of life. See, we as human beings, we are who we are today in this world. One thing that's really worked for us is the tools that we created, isn't it? Every instrument or every machine that we have created is only an extension of our existing faculties. We have not created anything absolutely new. Everything is just an extension of our existing faculties. So the deities are like this, they're made for different purposes. For every kind of purpose in life, there is one deity. So if you want money, there's one deity. If you want power, there's another deity. You want knowledge, there's another deity. You want love, there's another deity. You want to be fearless, there's another deity. Like this for everything. So these deities came up like this to serve different purposes of human life. Different energy forms were created. There is a whole science of consecration. 
It's a very powerful science. You must come and experience, there is one here at the Tennessee Center. If you come to India, it will just blast you in the face, you don't have to believe anything. It is not by belief, just the very energy there is like that because these are consecrated spaces created for specific purposes. To teach yoga, we consecrate one way, to make other experiences happen. This Dhyana Linga means it's a meditative form. Without any instruction, people will become meditative. No instruction, no previous experience. The energy itself is meditative, you don't have to know anything, it makes you like that. So this is a science that was explored, this is like creating any other instrument. You have a science and technology, you can make uh, wonderful life-saving instruments out of it, or you can make a gun out of it, you can make anything out of it, you could have made anything out of it. So people made various deities for different purposes in their life. But this thing about this is the god never existed in the country or in that culture.